it's coming. I know it's coming. Continues. Jaws the Revenge. Next Saturday, 7.45, BBC One. On BBC Two in ten minutes, the first of two Roman Polanski moving pictures is a timber-shivering 17th century adventure on the high seas. With Walter Matthau as a marooned buccaneer rescued from the brink of cannibalism and certain indigestion in Pirates. After the news on Saturday Night Clive, Ben Elton will be facing Frank Bruno for the title of fastest man to be defeated by Frank Bruno. I expect to win the title within seconds of the opening bell of the first round. See Ben Elton as the man who was not ready to meet Frank Bruno after the news. This is BBC One. It's a quarter to ten. Iraq frees the jailed British businessman Ian Richter. Britain unfreezes Iraqi assets in this country. His wife celebrates his release from five years in prison. He's flying home tomorrow. The UN envoy Cyrus Vance arranges another ceasefire in Yugoslavia and says this time it must be genuine. Good evening. The release of the businessman Ian Richter, imprisoned in Iraq for five years, was announced in Baghdad by the United Nations Special Envoy, Prince Adudin Aga Khan. In return, the government has unlocked £70 million of Iraqi assets frozen in British banks since the Gulf War. It will be used to buy food and medicine for Saddam Hussein's sanction-hit country. The Prime Minister said he was delighted at the news and looked forward to welcoming Ian Richter home. Peter Gould reports. At the family home, Shirley Richter was still trying to take in the news when the phone rang. It was her husband. It's just absolutely wonderful. I can't believe it. <laughs> what, what have you heard? What's the latest? Well, I, I'm still waiting for confirmation. Um, and whilst I was waiting for confirmation, the phone rang and it was Ian. He's at the Rashid Hotel in Baghdad with Prince Sadruddin. And he just sounded terribly, terribly relieved and excited to be coming home. What did, what did he, he say to you? you? What did he say? Oh, we just babbled away. I can't even remember. I was shaking like what, a leaf. The United Nations Special Envoy, Prince Sadruddin Aga Khan, had repeatedly called on Iraq to set Mr Richter free. Well, it's very good news indeed, and it's another feather in the cap, I think, of the United Nations, because Prince Sadruddin has uh, succeeded where many of us had failed in the past to try and get Ian Richter released. Ian Richter was arrested in 1986 and accused of bribery, a charge he's always denied. But after a brief court hearing, he was jailed for life. Shirley Richter visited Baghdad several times to see him in jail and to plead for his release. But for several anxious weeks during the Gulf War, no one knew if he'd survived the bombing of Baghdad. Then in June, the release of Douglas Grand, the British engineer jailed for allegedly spying, raised hopes that Mr Richter's release would follow. And today, friends and neighbours shared the family's delight. Just, uh, I can't believe it. <laughs> I mean, I was so excited because we waited so long for this to happen. I mean, you know, we sort of lived through this with Shirley and Ian for five, six years, you know, and it's just unbelievable. We've waited so long, and I think that, you know, the whole of the parish has felt with him and also, of course, very much with Shirley and the children. Um, the lack of his company, the lack of his presence. Mr Richter was given just five minutes to pack his belongings before his release. He's lost weight in jail but says that otherwise he's in good shape. Back home the champagne is on ice, yellow roses are being delivered by the dozen and the family's reaction can be summed up in a single word. Shock! <laughs> I've just got, got to go and see my mum. What now? What now? I'm terribly excited, I just want to see my mum. And tonight, after a phone call from the Prime Minister, the whole family toasted the freedom of the husband and father who tomorrow they will welcome home. Well, just over an hour ago, I spoke to Ian Richter on the phone from Baghdad and I asked him how it felt to be free. Well, it's, it's quite wonderful. It's difficult really to express just how, how wonderful it is. Um, out of those four walls and 
in a hotel and with pleasant people and having discussions on worldly affairs and other affairs. It's just lovely. How are you treated by your captors? Well, in the last year or so, I've been treated remarkably well. Were you tortured? Really, I, I don't want to get into the, the, the early days, you know. I, <laughs> I don't think it's productive, no. I just want to look forward to a happy future. Did you ever give up hope that you would be free again? I don't think I ever lost hope entirely. I think surely my wife is responsible for that. She's been such a positive person and she's given such great support and she's been so loyal that I really owed it to her to keep going. <laughs> your wife told us earlier that she was so excited by your first phone call today that she can't remember what you said. What did you say? I just remember that we were both emotional and I remember her telling me that she'd booked a skiing holiday and that I'd now join it, and I really look forward to that. Um, and I think we both wondered about collecting our children for all, from all various parts of England. What is it about Britain that you're most looking forward to returning to? Well, I think there's that aspect of democracy in Britain which is very hard to find elsewhere. We complain about this and that, but we do stand up for our rights, and there is this feeling of freedom in Britain, which is wonderful, and I think that I look forward to more than anything else. In unfreezing millions through as expected. That's it. We're back tomorrow here.